Well, thank you very much. It's a delight to be here at the Crystal. I've never been in the Crystal, been to Crystal Palace, but never the Crystal. So this is uh, obviously a very energy efficient building, very appropriate venue. What I want to talk about, in a sense, is my journey through uh, what's led me to being a co-author of the Global Apollo program, to explain to you what it is, to explain to you why I think it is actually probably the most important block that we're missing in terms of solving the problem of uh, uh, how we make the planet sustainable, how we make our lives on this planet sustainable. I've seen the problems to getting sensible energy policy, basically politics, and I've done politics up close with a number of prime ministers. Um, the economics, sorting out the economics and understanding where the economics fits in. My life, I started life as a, an academic economist. I'm now chairman of Frontier Economics, so we do a lot of work on economics and energy regulation and how that fits. You need the science as well, and so um, David King, former chief scientific advisor when I was cabinet secretary, uh, and Martin Rees, his amazing brain of Martin's, um, uh, taught to me a, a lot about the science, not a science expert myself. And then, as, as was mentioned at the start, the, I am, uh, the whole behavioral insight. So I would set up the nudge team in government, um, working with David Halpern. I'm still the chair of their advisory panel, and it, it is an important part of this episode, which I won't be talking about today, but if people want to ask about it, yes, behavioral things. And the one thing I'd say is if you want people to do the right thing, the big message, more than any other message, is keep it simple to do the right thing. If you make it simple, that's what people will do. Very simple. And, and in the old days, I would have said, get the price signals right, get the incentives right, but actually, the keep it simple completely trumps virtually all of the other things, as we know from examples like loft insulation. So, politicians, where do they sit on all of this? And let me give you um, the whole trilemma, and you'll observe, observe this through the last election. These are, you know, if you're a politician, you worry about three things. You worry about affordability of energy, because that's consumer bills, which was mentioned today, the PwC report. Uh, Ed Miliband, in the election, got an enormous, a uh, lot of credibility from saying we're going to freeze prices. Actually, completely the wrong point, <laughs> and uh, wasn't very sensible, but there we are. Um, so affordability uh, matters in a lot of places. The drop in oil prices, of course, affecting how much that matters. The, the padlock is the security. That, as you will see from recent reports, uh, is starting to become the big issue, and I would expect that to be the big issue in the short term, the next couple of years. And of course, we've, we've made some big mistakes there on terms of managing the security issue, uh, ending up with lots of small diesels and people bidding for, power, for gas stations that they don't build because they bid at too low a price. Really dumb. Uh, I hope I would have not done that and um, making it clean. Uh, and when I look at that, I think, well, how are we trying to do that? And obviously, the way they've tried to solve the trilemma is, is basically through economics, try to get the prices right, and where are we on prices? This is something that um, Frontier put together. This shows you uh, uh, about the prices. The red ones are administered prices. The, the, uh, the greenish ones are the CFD auction prices for 2018-2019. Hinkley Point, I couldn't resist putting Hinkley Point on this. Uh, that If we don't kind of leave Hinkley Point as something of a beached whale, we've got this wrong. Well, I always, when I was in government, used to say the solution is we need some nuclear base load because of base load, intermittency of renewables kind of makes obvious sense. If nuclear is going to cost you 92 pounds per megawatt, then uh, and that's where we are, then we're in real trouble, right? Uh, those things for solar, offshore wind, and onshore wind, we have got to bring those prices down quite dramatically. We've got to find ways to do that. And that brings me on to, because I, I know I've only got 10 minutes here, so it's going to be hard to get this, to the Apollo program, which is completely designed at the, the point which says, how do we solve the trilemma in one go? Right? So I want to do the politics, the economics, and all the rest of it in one go. So uh, what is it that stops, uh, what is it that holds back all of the renewables and all the rest of it? And we've seen what the government's done. They've said, oh, it's, these subsidies are all too big. They're costing us too much. The answer is renewables are too expensive compared to fossil fuels. So the goal of Apollo is very simply make clean energy cheaper than coal. 
That's it. That's the goal. If we achieve that goal, then suddenly everything else goes away. Because if it's cheaper, you've solved the affordability problem. If it's cheaper, that's what the market will choose. Uh, if it's cheaper, you can say, actually, and everyone's using clean energy, you don't worry so much about the fact that energy demand, which we know, no matter how much we do on energy efficiency, energy demand globally is going to rise quite dramatically as Asia and Africa move forward. So the key solution is reducing the cost of renewables. Now, when you look at, so what are we doing to try and reduce the cost of renewables? How much money have we put into this? How much R&D has the world spent? And the answer is approximately zero, right? I'm afraid, you know, to, to the first degree of magnitude. It's very, very small. If you want the numbers exactly, look in the Global Apollo program on the website, give the numbers for R&D around the world. It's really small. Compared to the amount we're spending on subsidies, it's tiny. Right? If you want to make progress, and this is where Frontier Economics is doing some work now on the cost benefit behind Global Apollo, what we're saying is, look, in other areas, semiconductors, you look at vaccines, a whole sorts of other areas we're looking at, when you've put lots of investment in, you do reduce, you do finally get to stages where you reduce the cost of what you're trying to look at. The Apollo program, which I will move to now, well, sorry, this is why so one thing I should have mentioned here, one of the problems we've got with all of this on doing it through prices is that people don't believe you. And they're right not to believe you because the subsidy regime, this shows you those areas, good old Spain, where retroactively they've changed things. If you're an investor, and I am on the board, just to be full disclosure, of Brookfield Asset Management who invest in a lot of renewables, uh, this is a nightmare to you. You've invested under a certain regime, and then they retroactively change it, or they change it a few months later. That is not good. Um, so I think all sorts of problems with uh, uh, regimes and doing it through prices. So global Apollo idea. What the Americans did with Apollo was say, in, we've got this existential threat that Russia is going to beat us. They're going to put a man on the moon before us. So America. Let's put all our scientists to work on solving that problem and getting there before them. Right? And they did it. Not in 10 years, in 8 years. If you concentrate scientific effort, if you make it the inspiration of a generation to solve this problem, suddenly you get initiative. Suddenly breakthroughs come where they weren't before. Now, we all know the kinds of areas, and actually this conference is about a lot of them, that are actually going to transform it. I was talking to Ellen from DARPA yesterday about the kinds of initiatives the US are looking at in terms of new technologies, how to improve the, the maths behind tra the transformer process from DC to AC and all the rest of it. Really, really interesting projects. They work closely with the private sector. They've got 30 new projects, one of which is going to get there. Right? We have no idea which one of those 30, but one of which is going to make a significant breakthrough. They work with the private sector. So, I think this could make a huge difference. Um, we are, so our idea is go for this. We've suggested that uh, as Apollo was just the US, so this time we, we make it global. Hence, uh, we want a number of countries to be doing this. Uh, we've suggested a 10 year program where they all put in 0.02% of GDP. Now, uh, the UK government, where are they on this? They're waiting till after the spending review. Ah! Um, that can't be quoted, that's why I did it, <laughs> right? Um, I am very frustrated by that. Um, this, I think, is one of the key answers. If Paris comes out with certain commitments, how are they going to achieve those commitments? We know that Paris will have commitments which are um, the right direction, the wrong pace, if I could summarize it. Um, this could give the answer. We are already getting fantastic support for this. Uh, Thanks to Hedlund, who've worked with us on this, and also uh, David Attenborough, who's a star, who's kind of got President Obama interested. So there's going to be a lot of countries that I hope will support this program. They will, of course, rebadge it and call it their own thing. They will have a slightly different take to it. But actually, as long as we've got that target of making renewables cheaper than coal, uh, then depending on the number of countries uh, and the amount they're prepared to put in, that will change the amount of time before we hit that. As long as we focus on that as the way of doing things, we, I think, will uh, achieve uh, a great step forward. 
Once we've got countries signed up, and I'm very much hoping before the end of the month, because this has got to come ahead of Paris, because Paris is just about some commitments with no mechanisms to make sure they happen. So it's going to be somewhat disappointing, let's be honest. This, I think, has the promise of actually taking us to that nirvana where you suddenly solve that trilemma. Once those announcements are made, there's an enormous amount of work to do on collaboration. We've seen things like the work that's been done internationally on semiconductors and the like. Um, so it is feasible. It's telling me I am now 19 seconds over time. So in 10 minutes, that's how you solve the world. Thank you.